Yep. Yep. Let's go. Cool. Right. <laughs> right. Let's be <laughs> right. So we'll come back to that. <laughs> we'll come back okay. to that. So anyway, thanks so much for doing this as well. And um, one big topic I want to uh, touch on with you is that I know you've done many different, uh, you, you delve into many different topics as well, but the ancient technology conversation is a huge topic that we would love to dive into, you, what you, the work you've done on that. I mean, but um, and I think as well, I mean, obviously there's this big new movement now and a resurgence of people looking back at our past human intelligence and sort of questioning these different areas. But in regards to sort of ancient technology, what was it initially that sort of pulled you into the area of that in your life? Like what fascinated you by the ancient technology conversation? It was basically a discovery. Um, I was fortunate to be able to go to Egypt uh, on a tour with John Anthony West and Nexus Magazine and David Childress. So it was a, it was a, should we say, a questing conference, yeah. a questing <laughs> visit. And I was there. I went to the normal sites: Giza pyramids, uh, Valley of the King, uh, Valley of the Kings, and the uh, Luxor site, and down to Aswan, where the unfinished obelisk is which is a massive great piece of stone. And on top of this stone are these strange scoop marks. And I said to somebody, I said, well, what are these scoop marks for? I mean, they're, they're not that big. Nobody knew. Nobody had the slightest idea what they were. Oh, really? Oh, I hadn't, I yeah. know. It's, it's sort of thing that unless you're looking for them, you don't actually see them because you think it's all part of what's there. So you've got these strange scoop marks on top of the unfinished obelisk. Nobody knew what they were. Now, the unfinished obelisk being granite, you need something pretty secu- pretty hefty to make a scoop mark in it. Yeah. And I thought, well, how was it made? Oh, I'll tell you how they got the thing out. They used pounding deorite balls. Yeah, that's, a laugh. that's so funny, that, by the way. You know, you think, <laughs> hang, hang on a minute. No, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't equate. Not to somebody who can build the pyramids and the obelisks and the incredible statues. I mean, some of them are spectacularly beautiful. Just mark. imagine, though, just imagine um, loads of, um, supposedly loads of uh, human beings just having these rocks and just for hours and hours just pounding, 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 pounding. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> now, it, it is technically possible to take a, a rock... People can't even exercise of, for 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, it, it takes you five hours to, to pound away to remove one inch of granite over a square foot. Yeah. So if you do the calculation, it would take 35 years to, to, to get the granite removed from the unfinished obelisk. So it just, that didn't make sense. Mm. And also, if you look around the unfinished obelisk, you see the same scoop marks all around it. But nobody knew what they were. So that set me off trying to work out, well, how do you cut, carve, and carry granite? Mm. And that's where it began. Right. And the best I answer I've come up with is the rock-softening liquid, mm. which we know exists in South America, trouble is nobody's ever found it again it's, it's it was known to exist until quite recently i believe it still does if you can go into Cusco, if you know what it's called in peruvian or in spanish you'll you'll be able to get it it's a liquid which if put onto um a piece of granite will soften it so it becomes like the consistency of putty and you can then carve it like you could putty or granite and there was a Spanish priest there in the 1930s who claimed to have rediscovered it. It's, it's co- basically a combination of plants, like ayahuasca is a combination of plants, yeah. which each on their own won't do very much, but when combined together will. Same with the rock softening liquid. It's a p- combination of plant juices, w- which is what South America is well known for. Mm. So if you put them in a certain proportion, they will then have this property of softening in this case, granite. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's a reasonable explanation. Let's see if we can see if there are any other places. So, been looking at it for the last 15 years, trying to find out if there is some logic to that suggestion. And nobody's ever proved me wrong, fortunately, but nobody's ever come up with the rock softening liquid. So we're still back where we started. How do you make these marks in the granite? Yeah, simple questions as well. And it's, it's certainly, you cannot cut granite with copper. Let's just hit that one right on the head right now. Yeah. Copper is a soft metal. Copper is the only metal that is supposed to have been available to the ancient Egyptians, those famous people who built the pyramids yeah. somehow. How did they? Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> We're told that they did all this wonderful statuary, and the carving with, uh, with, with copper chisels. No, that, that makes no sense at all. And anybody who claims that that is the way it was done either doesn't know what they're talking about 
from a, from a, a metallurgical point of view, yeah. from a historical point of view, from a scientific point of view, or from a logical point of view. So they're talking complete and utter rubbish. So there has to be another solution to this problem of how do you cut, carve, and carry granite. And that's the exciting part. Yeah, it really mm. is. So what what some of the... I mean, you've obviously been researching this topic of ancient technology very extensively for a while now. I mean, what are some other sort of um, interesting sort of anomalies that you're seeing in regards to other ancient artifacts or ancient structures being more highly more advanced than we're led to believe like what what other structures have you come across that you are you believe that are, are highly advanced is there any other sort well, of things that you've come across well we start with the pyramids yeah. as being the most obvious example yeah. they they're not the way they were originally built and the idea that the pyramids we're talking about the giza pyramids the great pyramid the middle pyramid the mancuri pyramid um which are laid out, ironically, in the uh, shape of Orion's belt on the astrological symbol. I mean, is, is that a coincidence, or did it happen to be deliberately done there? And then when you look at the uh, um, pyramids in Mexico, which are laid out in the same way, the pyramids in China laid out in the same way, these are more than coincidences. The other uh, objects, there are many in India, which haven't really been properly identified. Um, uh, Kailasa Temple, I think it's called, in central India, which is a magnificent, I mean, you can go and see it today, it's a magnificent depiction, or well, it's more than depiction, it's a creation of an Indian temple, as we would expect it. It's very highly carved, very intricately carved, but it's carved out of the bedrock. It was carved from the top down, because you couldn't carve it from the bottom up if it's bedrock. You've got to start at the top. It's, it's an outcrop of, uh, of granite which has been carved. How was that done? I mean, that is extraordinary. Mm. This is several hundred feet long. It's about 200 feet deep. There are depictions of animals and um, uh, dis geometric designs all over it. And they're beautifully proportioned. You can't make a mistake you make a mistake in a piece of bedrock, you know, you've got to start with another piece of bedrock. Yeah. Mm. So somebody had the technology to do it. So you've got those. And then you've got the, the Maui in um, Easter Island. How were those carved? Just carved out of the bedrock again. Uh, they were moved over, not that big a distance, but moved over a certain distance. How was that done? I mean, these, these things weigh 20 tonnes. It's like taking a fully loaded shipping container, 40-foot shipping container, and sort of moving it. Well, today we can do a shipping container quite easily. You stick it on the back of a truck and drive it along. Mm. But you've got to lift it onto the truck in the first place. So how do you do that? Well, you've got a big crane. So where did all this technology come from? And then the further back in time you go, you get back to uh, 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 Gobleki, Gobleki Tepe yeah, in southeast Turkey, which has been demonstrated or been confirmed as being 9,500 BC, uh, 11,500 years old. Where did that come from? Yeah. How did somebody have the technology to create 20 foot high, 20 ton blocks of limestone, stick them upright on astronomical l linings? And what's been uh, discovered and excavated so far is less than 10% of what is known to exist in, on that site. There are other sites around. The, um, the famous underground cities in Turkey. How are these all excavated? And you come back to this date, this 11,500 uh, years ago, 9,500 BC date, which seems to be a date confirmed in many places around the world as being a definitive date. It's as if something happened just before that date, which brought civilization as it was then to a grinding and ir almost irreversible halt. Mm. Whether it was the, the, the notorious flood, which we know about in Noah, but that flood myth exists all over the world. Yeah, it does, yeah. Except for one country. There's one country it's that the doesn't Bible have well. a flood myth. That's Japan. It's one of the very few countries, it's the only major country that doesn't have the flood myth. Looking at the sea levels around Japan, Japan has never been attached to basically to the mainland. Yeah. It's always existed the way it is at the moment. 
because it has very deep waters all around it. If the sea levels were, rose, which they are known to have done, about 400 feet, I think is the accepted figure, and most people prior to uh, those sea level rises would have lived near the coast, a lot of the coast was now underwater. Yeah. So a lot of the civilizations that we would have found have been drowned. We, we don't know about them. But what would have caused something like that? Forget global warming, it's nothing to do with that. Yeah. Even historical versions of it wouldn't produce that level. It's something much more dramatic. And looking into the historical record, you find things like dragons in the sky, that's the description normally given, or thunderbolts in the sky. If there was a passing fragment of a supernova, this is the uh, most logical explanation, a fragment of a su exploding star heading from wherever it exploded towards our sun, which is the, the main gravitational attraction in, in the solar system, heading in that direction, passing relatively close to the Earth, it would act like a big version of the moon. Now the moon we know affects our tides. Mm. Supposing there was a major fragment, vastly bigger than the moon, vastly bigger than Mars, maybe even the size of Jupiter, passing relatively close to the Earth, it would cause huge flooding. It would, it would attract it towards it as it approached Earth, and it, as it passed Earth, it would then move across the planet, and as it moved away, gradually <coughs> the gravitational attraction of the fragment would diminish, and so it would release the water. This is a logical explanation for the flood. It's not a lot of rain, because there's only, there is a, there is a finite amount of fluid on this planet. Mm -hmm. It gets recycled by heat and cloud. It goes up in the clouds. Sunlight ev evaporates it from the ocean. It goes up, becomes clouds, it condenses, comes back as rain. There's only a certain amount of water that can do that. And we haven't got enough water on this planet to rain that hard for that long yeah. to create that amount of devastation. Something else happened. If that did happen, and there was a civilization prior to it, and that civilization got 99% wiped out by this devastating event. Mankind's memory of it would be such that it would be similar to the memory of somebody who presently experiences a life-threatening and devastating event. Their memory of it will be wiped. They will, in order to survive, they have to forget it. They can't survive by remembering such a devastating event. So if, he, if mankind as a race experienced an, an event of such magnitude and of such devastation that he would prefer to forget it, that may be what's happened. That's maybe why we are, as Graham Hancock so accurately describes it, the human race is a race with amnesia. Mm. There's a lot we don't remember. It doesn't mean to say it didn't happen. We just don't remember it. And we, because we don't remember it, we tend to ignore it or d consign it to myth and legend. Mm. Myth and legend have a basis in fact. They have to. The oral tradition of Native Americans, of the Chinese history, Indian history, indicates that something occurred before our present civilization, which supposedly started 6,000 years ago. I can give you an exact date for the starting of our current civilization is 4004 BC, oh. October the 22nd, four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> right, that was when like civilization <laughs> began. <laughs> and do you know how we know that? I was going to ask you that. I it's <laughs> very easy to calculate. You take the King James Bible, which was first translated into English in 1611, and Bishop Usher of Armagh, did the very simple calculation of taking uh, the book of Genesis and calculating all the begats and all the f going back from Adam and Eve and he went all the way back and calculated taking a, a generation as being 25 years all the way through to uh, King David 
and you calculate all the generations, and that's how you come up with the date of 4004 BC. And that's when civilization began. Wow. And because <coughs> that's when the church, the established church, says civilization began, up to 1859, nobody could challenge it. Yeah. Because the established church was the authority. Yeah. You do not ch you do not challenge authority, or you get hit very hard. Yeah. <laughs> Heretics tend to end up oh, roasted, <laughs> or um, yeah, very unpleasant anyway. So people tended to say, "Oh yes, sir, yes, yes, Mr. Priest, sir, yes, yes, we agree with you. Yes, four thousand four BC couldn't happen before that. No, no, <laughs> could, nothing could happen before that." And I mentioned eighteen fifty nine when things changed. 1859 was the date, was the publication of Charles Darwin's book, Origin of Species, mm. which challenged the established church. That's basically what it did. He wasn't right. Darwin claimed, didn't claim very much, but the book was taken up as a cudgel to hit the, church, the established church with, which is what they did. The established church wasn't right. Now we have the same situation again. We have scientism. Yeah. as the established church. If you do not agree with science, you are a pseudo-scientist. Yeah, yeah, you are like an anti-scientist. <laughs> you are a feeble-minded idiot. Is the normal, you know, some of these epithets get hurled about because people tend to be a little bit um, protective of their established church. Yeah. And the established church is science. And now it, that church the archaeological church and the paleontological church and all the other churches are being challenged by people who are thinking, say, these aren't, this is not the, f the right, this, there is more to life than we are being told. Yeah. Mm. Let's have a look for it. So w before when you were talking in terms of, um, back on the ancient, on the ancient technology, I mean, when you were, you were talking about all these different cultures around the world, that disease seems to be, anyway, to me, that disease I mean, well, are you finding similar? Do you find any similarities in the in the sort of technology that we use to build all these megalithic structures all around the world? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's one of its major features. Yeah. Um, we see in 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 Egypt, for instance. Let's start with Egypt. You see uh, on the on the Mancuri pyramid. That's the the smaller of the three Giza pyramids. Oh. There are granite blocks on the lower courses of the pyramid. They're still there today. You can go and see them. On these blocks, there are... Is that the one with, like, the T-shape? It's like a T-shape, is, is, that, is that correct? The way it was built, like a T-shape? Like, the, the rock itself was all manufactured, like, sort of like a T-shape? Is um, that correct? Not specifically t shape no. They, they are rectangular, more than anything Yeah, else. I was... They, they're they're, they're, they're of blocks of different. granite. Um, I'll show you one now. Um, they're blocks of granite, and they have little um, nodules on them obviously deliberately placed there. Nobody can work out what those nodules are. In front of the Sphinx, which is also on the Giza Plateau, there are two temples. One is called the Sphinx Temple, the other calls the Valley Temple. You can't go into the Sphinx Temple. Um, it's been closed for as long as anybody can remember. You can look into it, but you can't go into it. You can go into the Valley Temple, and in the Valley Temple, there are the lining of the temple is granite, beautifully carved granite. And ironically, the outer walls of this valley temple are made of limestone, the limestone that was quarried from the, around the Sphinx. It's what creates the Sphinx enclosure. So where did they put the, the limestone they took out of it? They built the temple in front of the Sphinx. These are 100-ton blocks, by the way. But the granite which lines the inside is carved to fit around the limestone, which makes no sense. But they are, because I looked specifically for that when I visited. You go down to um, Luxor, take a coach trip two hours north of Luxor, you come to Dendera and Abydos. Abydos is where the uh, Temple of Seti is. Temple of Seti is what you'd expect. It's a, it's a rather magnificent temple built by Seti I, who was uh, Ramesses II's father. So he had a, a bit of a megalomaniac building program going on. But behind the Temple of Seti I is the Assyrian. Very few people even know it exists, let alone been to visit it. I'm fortunate to have done so. It is totally unadorned. It is below the level of the sand, and it is made of 100-ton granite blocks. 
arranged very specifically. Uh, it's called the Asarian because when it was discovered by Flinders Petrie in 1894, when somebody said, look, there's a bit of a dip in the desert over there, why don't we see what's underneath? And that's what they found. Allegedly, Asarian is the uh, funeral place of Asaris. You can't often go into the Asarian. It's a fairly simple 60 foot by about 30 foot enclosure below the level of the desert today. And quite often it's flooded. Flooded in the desert? Mm. The water level goes up and down because it is connected to the Nile, which is five miles away. Yeah. It wasn't when it was built. Mm. Five miles away. When I was there, I was fortunate to get inside it and I could see the catfish in the little uh, in lakes, the little uh, enclosures in the Asarian. Yeah. There's a catfish in there. It comes from the Nile. So it's connected to the Nile. If you look at the walls of this Asarian, so also made of granite, there are these same nodules on the blocks. And then you go to South America, you go to Cuzco, and you go to uh, Olente Tambo and uh, Saxway Human, and you see the same style of block made of andesite, which is the South American name for granite. Yeah. Same level of hardness. On the, on the Mohs scale, I think it's seven. And one of the very few things that will cut granite is diamond. It's one of the very few stones harder than granite. Another stone that will cut it is carborundum. But not very much carborundum in South America. There are not many diamonds in South America. So how did they cut it? And these aren't just small blocks. These are massive 100-ton blocks. Some of them even bigger. Fitting without mortar so closely together that they are immune to earthquake damage. Yeah. Wow. The uh, Corichanta, Corichanta, I think it's the pronunciation in Cusco, which is the base of the cathedral in Cusco, where the Spanish built their uh, cathedral, is made of even more spectacularly beautiful carved granite blocks. We've already mentioned Easter Island. Yeah. Uh, we're going west now, where you've got the, uh, the Maui, the the famous statues, some of which have been found buried 50 foot below the ground level. If you do the calculation, yes, there are uh, there is material floats down from space onto Earth, and I believe the accepted figure is about one inch in a hundred years it will gradually build up the soil or soil level. Mm. Well, if it's 50 foot, that's uh, 600 inches. That's many, and it takes one century per inch. We're talking 60,000 years to bury that deep. Wow. Well, that makes no sense in terms of our present history. Does that make our present history wrong? Yeah. Yes. Does it make an investigation required into ancient technology much more necessary? Yes, of course it does. We need to open up. We haven't even started to cover the incredible megalithic structures discovered in Russia, in Bulgaria, in Romania, in Siberia. Supposedly as well as um, ones that, supposedly people talk about there's ones in Antarctica as well, yet they'd be undiscovered. And if obviously if Graham, Ham Graham Hancock's correct and he believes that the, there was a sh some sort of shift to do with the continents and Antarctica was actually in a hotter climate, there could be pyramids in Antarctica as well, which are and yet to be uncovered. the un Earth Crust Displacement yeah. Theory of Charles Hapgood. Yeah, uh, really fascinating. claimed that the the crust of the Earth, or the top of 20 miles or so of the Earth, moved in relation to the molten inner core of the Earth. Yeah. Well, we know the, the molten inner core of the Earth. One has to then look at what would cause that. It wouldn't just happen. There would have to be some energy, some form of, uh, of access, some uh, access to some form of energy to cause the crust of the Earth to move in relation to the core. Now, whether it is a, a magnetic energy, whether it is a, something hitting it, yeah. um, I don't know. Mm. But it would need some sort of energy. But earth crust displacement is a, a very persuasive theory, as I say, put forward originally in 1953 by uh, Professor Charles Hapgood, who had the support and encouragement of Albert Einstein at the time, who claimed that what he was proposing was not only logical, it was more likely than anything else. Yeah, yeah. If that had occurred, and the accepted figure for the 
displacement of the crust is about between 1,500 and 2,000 miles. If Antarctica was not always where we where we know it is today, I south, 90 degrees south, if it was displaced from a previous location, it would be where, let's say, South Africa is today. And we know that South Africa today is a very temperate climate, very mild climate, it's a very nice climate. This would account for the discovery of certain fossilized remains in Antarctica, which indicate that it was at some at some point able to support forests, trees, which trees wouldn't have appeared on Earth more than 350 million years ago, based on the paleontological record. So it would be something within the last 350 million years, assuming trees had occurred, yeah. uh, trees were there. Trees have been discovered. There are places in Antarctica now which are completely ice-free, where the water is unfrozen, and that is the uh, underground heat of volcanoes. There are active volcanoes in Antarctica. Oh. Whether the proposal that Antarctica is the the site of the legendary land of Atlantis is another story. That was a proposal put forward by uh, Colin Wilson and Rand Flamath in uh, the book uh, From Atlantis to the Sphinx. Mm. Whether that's correct or not is open to debate, and it may well account for the very strange events that occurred in Antarctica about a year ago, where very prominent politicians, Vladimir Putin being one, John Kelly, Secretary of State in the United States being another, the Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, Buzz Aldrin, alleged astronaut, well, astronaut, um, they all went to Antarctica to see something but they wouldn't say what it was that they yeah, were going yeah. to see. <laughs> it's almost as if something had been identified, whether on purpose or by accident. What do you think it was, yeah. personally? I think, <laughs> there was, it was, I think it was to do with the Vostok Lake um, drilling, that something had been identified as being as of, of intelligent construction, had been identified under the ice. Whether it was the remains of Atlantis, whether it was the famous Schwabenland, location of the German Navy after World War Two, I don't know because we don't have enough information but something was certainly discovered uh, because these people wouldn't just go to Antarctica at relatively short notice you had to play in the snow <laughs> <laughs> you know because what is there to see I mean you know what talking a, a very beautiful place it's all white and it's very cold, there's a lot of wind, and, and it's not a place you go for a holiday, not in the middle of Antarctica. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there is that, I mean, that's a question mark which I think is still being resolved. I don't know, I know what I'd like it to be, I'd like it to be Atlantis, because this would confirm the famous Plato story. But whether it is or not, which indicates that Atlantis existed 9,600 years ago, and that something happened. And there is certainly evidence, and I think it's been, there are many researchers who have identified a particular event in time, about 9,600 years ago, 11,500 BC, that something major happened on this planet, um, which brought civilization as it was then to a grinding halt. Yeah. It took five, several thousand years to, to climb out of the Maybe the nuclear winter, maybe it was hit by something. Uh, the idea of a nuclear winter where you get dust in the atmosphere blocking out the sunlight, and we all get cold and no crops grow. Uh, it's a logical thing, it's not a practical thing, it's not something which is gonna happen. And if you set off enough nuclear bombs, which by the way won't go off just anywhere, this is one of the great myths of our time that nuclear weapons are in some, somehow are a terrible threat to humanity. They're not, they're complete, <laughs> complete fabrication, the whole thing. Complete oh. fiction. I was just thinking. Uh, <coughs> sorry, oh, I've just been fascinated. I've, honestly, I've sat here in silence all the way through this. I've just been fascinated by it all. So much, isn't it? Oh, there is yeah. for so much. And I was just thinking there. Are we actually the the more that time passes, are we actually getting closer to? to I know we we're talking now, and it's fascinating revelations. Are we getting closer now to exposing this, or are we just uncovering more mysteries about these ancient technologies? Good point. I think one of each. One of each. I think we're, we're uncovering more because more people are interested. There are 
tens of thousands of people who are fascinated by these these areas. But because they're amateurs, in other words, they're, they're people who just sort of, oh, that's an interesting area. I wonder what the answer to that is. And they'll watch film about it, watch documentaries about it, they'll read books, they'll talk to friends about it, but they're not professionals with PhDs and MAs. You know what PhD stands for? Preconceived Hypothesis Disorder. <laughs> <laughs> so let's not go there. There's actually a funny, a quick, quick funny story. There's a funny story about, um, I can't remember who it was now, it was a guy anyway, and he was on his Twitter page, he was going around and he was... Um, he was he's, he was just randomly putting the letters PhD in front of his um, Twitter account, and um, people were messaging him saying, oh, like when he was when he was talking about conspiracy theories or something like that, people would uh, would message him on Twitter saying, oh, I expected more from you with being a PhD, but all he'd done is obviously he just made it up and just put the letters in front of his character, and then there was another <laughs> f- funny story linked to that. It was a guy. Um, a guy who actually had a PhD, he messaged them back on Twitter saying, "Oh, you look, you've took my PhD, for, you've put, took me PhD, for, PhD from us." So basically, just highlighting the fact that the letters, letters are just bullshit, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. It's 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 the information that you identify. It's the evidence that you uncover. You know, one could say say anything you like, but unless you can produce evidence, yeah. there are three things I believe in: Father Christmas. The Tooth Fairy <laughs> and the Easter Bunny. Yeah. <laughs> For everything else, I want evidence. <laughs> it's like that, that simple. It really is that simple. Now, if I'm told to believe something, I then will immediately question the uh, uh, motives of the person requ- requiring that me to believe it. You, know, you will believe that the ancient Egyptians built the pyramid in, fourth, in 2750 BC. No, I won't. Yeah. I want to know how they did it. Yeah. When, when before as well, just to jump in, but when you were talking before about the, all the, you were mentioning, going into great detail on all the different similarities and all the constructions of all these different structures around the world. I mean, have you ever questioned what that actually suggests to you? I mean, because one thing I can think of straight away, I mean, does that, because it could, maybe, I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there, but it suggests to me that maybe these civilizations had some form or way of communicating this information across vast distances that we don't understand. I mean, have you ever explored that in your mind oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um it, it's an area that which in fact um i think was uh investigated very well by um rupert sheldrake mm. looking at morphic resonance yeah, yeah. where where uh, basically he's, he's looking at um, I and mean, one of the things he's looking at was how do dogs know when you're coming home yeah well how did they know because they obviously do know that you're about to appear yeah. but you're well out of sight the other thing he looked at was the uh, there's a, in Japan. Obviously, we know Japan has many many islands, and on one particular island, uh, it was uh, it was observed that uh, some of the monkeys on the island were washing the 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 fruit and the potatoes. I think sweet potatoes. They were washing them in fresh water, as opposed to salt water, because it was uh, obviously f- tasted better. Yeah. And then it was observed that on, on close by, but not connected, other locations and other groups of monkeys started to do the same thing. Yeah. They couldn't see what was happening. They couldn't, no monkey from one group came to another, but they suddenly started doing the same thing. And, and this, is, this is quite a well-established fact now that, that information travels without physical uh, as we understand it, without physical communication. Yeah. So that implies that it is a form of consciousness. It may well be that what we observe is inexplicable to us today because we don't understand the technology that created it in the first place. There's a very good example of, um, and we're talking of, you know, how on earth do you carry granite you know how do you how do you get a 70 ton block of granite 200 foot up in the air yeah easy you got a crane they didn't have them in ancient egypt there was no pictures of them anyway yeah so they had another technology in 1938 uh a swedish doctor and it wasn't ropes and pulleys <laughs> what? i says it wasn't ropes and pulleys like pulley it wasn't definitely it wasn't ropes and pulleys like pulleys. It, it wasn't ropes because it didn't have strong enough ropes and if you use on little tiny little um, little wooden wheels <laughs> no it wouldn't be wooden wheels because uh, 70 ton blocks of granite tend to crush wooden rollers yeah 
1938, a Swedish doctor was invited to um, visit Lhasa in Tibet uh, because uh, he had made friends at, I think it was Oxford University, he was working and he'd made friends with uh, some lamas who were visiting Britain and just before the Second War. And he agreed to go out and treat people because obviously they didn't have very good health care at that time in, in Tibet. And he went out very successfully treated. I don't know what it was he was treating, but obviously they were very pleased with the results because they offered to demonstrate for him the levitation of rocks, a five-ton rock. And he was allowed to film it, which he did. He also drew diagrams of it. And the diagram indicates that the, the rock, the five-ton rock, was going to be elevated 250 foot up in the air onto a ledge of a, of a mountain, whether they were building a temple there or not, it doesn't really matter, but it was going to be lifted 200 foot up in the air, 250 foot up in the air. So they assembled a group of drummers with varying sized drums from six foot down to one foot, uh, a number of trumpeters, <coughs> and a the human voice, a choir. These were all assembled in a, a right angle to the rock that was going to be levitated. It was directed by presumably head monk. And what was observed was once the drum started, the trumpet started, the human voice played at certain frequencies, the rock levitated. And this was filmed, we're told. The trouble is the film has never surfaced. Yeah. A bit like a, the, um, the it was moon a, landing apparently as well. confiscated. <laughs> moon landing footage. <laughs> it, uh, this was just before World War II, don't forget. And it was apparently when the Swedish doctor um, returned to the UK, and the film was confiscated. And it was supposed to be released sort of 50 years later. Well, I've yet to see it. So mm. whether it existed or not, I don't know. Yeah. But the story of the levitation of the rocks appears to indicate that sound moves objects, which we know it does happen. We know sound can, well, uh, an opera singer can shatter a glass. Yeah. We know that because we've seen it, and that's not in dispute. It's vibrational force, isn't it, what it um, intends? Yes, it, it's a, it, a setting up an internal frequency within the, the structure. Now, whether that is the way in which large blocks of granite were moved, I don't know. But it could be. It's a logical explanation. Maybe somebody will demonstrate it. What, what do you think about the, um, I know, and one of your lectures as well like pre presentation sorry you talk about the 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 famous helicopter the depictions that were found in the pyramids that was it called temple yes of, that, temple that was of seti temple of seti the first yeah, yeah. What, what do you think about that because i thought that was i found i seen that years ago have you seen that or not i don't think so i've seen it's like a, in the within the pyramids on one of the tablets yeah. itself on the walls is that correct there's it, a it's it's about 50 foot above the ground yeah there's a depiction of a helicopter oh yes sorry i have seen it yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. I've got a picture in there. um Yes, it, it's um, a hieroglyph in the Temple of Seti I, which appears to illustrate what we would now today call a, um, a cargo lift helicopter, um, a tank, a glider, and there's one other, there's four objects there, I can't remember, anyway. That's what they appear to 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 indicate, and if you look at them, one well, actually looked well, like a UFO to me, like sort of like a UFO. Oh, that's right, um, UFO. Yeah, sort of circular, disc-shaped object. And for the life of me, that's what they look like. You know, yeah, a, yeah. A, a helicopter. It looks like a helicopter. It's got a body. It's got what looks like a blade. It's got a back wing. It's got looks like Apache helicopter. Could, actually, could like there not Apache. be anything yeah. like in Egypt? Um, in Egypt, what they were using at the time that could actually resemble and sort of. I've yet to see any other hieroglyph. Uh, I think you need to see the pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I, can, I can show you a picture, aren't I? Um, the explanation given by the experts is that it's what's called a palimpsest. A palimpsest, in this case, is... The explanation is that it was a, a hieroglyphic uh, depiction which was covered over and a new hieroglyph was carved in plaster above it, but bits of the top bit fell off and it makes the underneath bit come together with the top, but they don't mean anything. Yeah. That's the explanation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like that at all. It looks like one flat surface, mm -hmm. which appears to illustrate these strange objects. Now, I don't know if they do or not, 
because there's no historical context for it. The Temple of Seti I, built around 1400 BC, um, maybe they knew about what was going on. It would be much more exciting history mm. if we knew if, if that was what was going on. But then, of course, they couldn't be investigated because you can't really go back earlier than 4004 BC yeah. because you'll be upsetting the powers that be in the church. So nobody investigated it. And in fact, Petrie, Flinders Petrie, who's probably the most famous Egyptian archaeologist, um, was originally financed by the, uh, the Christian church in Britain to go to Egypt to confirm the biblical stories. But when he found that he couldn't confirm them, he could only extrapolate back to way before 4004 BC, he went back to about 5,500 BC. He basically got his funding cut off. Oh. Tends to happen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You <laughs> go against the established order and uh, you'll, get, you'll get cut off at the knees. Not the only thing you'll get cut off as well. <laughs> yeah, but fortunately, <laughs> Flinders Petrie was so... Well, it was such an eminent archaeologist, and they even named a museum after him in London. It's called the Petrie Museum. And in that museum, which is part of University College London, is what's called the famous Core 7 block. This is a piece of granite about four or five inches long, uh, recovered by Flinders Petrie on the Giza Plateau, along with many, many other pieces. Quite small pieces, but interesting. And this piece of granite, two inches in diameter, so four or five inches long, it's obviously a piece of granite, because you can tell what granite looks like, and it, it is circular, so it, hence it's called core number seven. So it was drilled out of somewhere else, and there is a circular groove around it. It's not lots of individual circles, it's one continuous groove, because when I photographed it, I put a piece of cotton around it, and the cotton follows the groove. Yeah. So it's circular. How was that done? Mm -hmm. How do you carve a granite, a circular piece of granite out of another piece of granite with a groove that's about one millimeter apart? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. But it, it was not done with a pounding deer right ball. That we can be reasonably sure <laughs> yeah, yeah. of. So let's start again. So all I'd say is if there are any Egyptologists out there, archaeologists out there, Get your act together, guys. Yeah. We need better answers. Yeah, mm. definitely. definitely. Something I want a, a question, a different question I want to ask you as well. I mean, this is I'm not, I'm not sure if you've actually thought about this, but in terms of the whole conversation of of, of the ancients, and we, I mean, there's there's evidence as well, which obviously you know about that um, the ancients were arguably across many different cultures were were depicting the planet in the solar system and things like that, certain sizes, certain shapes. But as well with the work that you've done on, like, sort of say modern day space. Like you, the way you're looking at the moon, the Apollo moon landings, and things like that. Is there any correlations between what you know about the modern day space travel and arguably what the ancients understood about uh, the planets and space travel and things like that? Sorry, not space travel, but the the planets. Is there any sort of um, anom anomalies when you correlate both of them two together? So, like, let's say the, the the story that we're getting now from NASA and things like that in terms of the moon and the size of the planets and things like that. Is there any differences between what we're being told now by our modern mainstream media compared to what the ancient Egyptians believed about the, the planets and things like that? Well, certainly the, the Sumerians, who are f uh, con contemporary or in some cases forerunners of the Egyptians, yeah. based in what we now call Iraq, they were fully aware of the location, size, and uh, position of our planet, our present solar system, yeah. because they had illustrations of it. They carved them on cylinder seals. It was Zachary Stitchin as well, who I think yes. covered that, wasn't it? There's some, there's some quite well-known illustrations of our solar system, which go back many thousands of years. So the, the idea that we didn't know that we, we lived on a globe, the, the idea that we didn't know what the other solar system consisted of until, was it 1830, they discovered Pluto, which has now been downgraded yeah. from a planet to a proto-planet because it's part of the Kuiper belt or whatever. Go there if you like. But it was known about. It's as if, I mean, that famous um, TV sitcom, Third Rock from the Sun, you know, that, that's, that's where we are. We are the third rock from the sun. Yeah. <laughs> if you're going from the sun outwards, if you're coming in from the outer planets, we're the, uh, the seventh rock in, but it depends how you measure it. Yes, 
they certainly know what they were. Now, whether the moon is what it is claimed to be, I, I don't have a lot of time for NASA in many cases. Yeah. I consider that they stand for never a straight answer because depending on what you <laughs> ask, them, you won't yeah. get a decent yeah. answer. Yeah. Never a straight answer. I, love that. <laughs> I might call a podcast that one. <laughs> yes, or numerous anomalies and scams abound. <laughs> yeah. Or no astronaut sent anywhere. Or <laughs> no ast- you know, not always scientifically accurate. Yeah. You can call them what you like, but yeah. they don't always come up with the right answer. Yeah, definitely. Just to, to sort of dig deeper as well, I know you sort of you skimmed like you answered that question there, but just to try and to relitify what I meant, because I want to try, I want to try and see if you. On, on, I don't know if there is any information. Maybe it's just me sort of digging. But when is there any sort of contradictions in what the Egyptians? told us in regards to the universe compared to what NASA's telling us now does that make sense is that better worded um, to be honest I wouldn't necessarily be able to do a direct comparison yeah. because what the Egyptians knew about the universe is very hard to to decipher in relation to what dear old NASA tell us about the universe yeah. we tend to think that NASA must know what they're talking about because they have bloody great rockets that disappear off into space yeah. <laughs> So if, if they're going to tell us what's happened when the rocket's gone to space, good luck to them. The Egyptians appeared to know. Now, whether the Egyptians were doing space travel, as we understand the term today, a big rocket in space disappear off, go into orbit around Earth or go to the moon or whatever, or whether, as the Egyptians were told, tended to concentrate, was on the travel of the human consciousness or soul or spirit following physical death is another matter. Yeah. They appear to have a greater understanding of what happens to us after death than we do even today. Uh, the pyramid texts go into great detail about the, the travel of the, of the human spirit. Yeah. And we're told that discovered outside the Great Pyramid was the solar boat, wow. the famous solar boat, which was then reassembled it's now on display outside the Great Pyramid, you can see it. There are two of them actually, one still to be assembled. And these were the boats in which the Pharaoh would travel across the cosmos, uh, similar to the way in which the Terracotta army was assembled so that the, uh, um, the emperors of China could have uh, a, a presumably a fairly effective fighting force to combat the devil on his way across to wherever he was on his way to. The point about that solar boat, by the way, which does exist, you can go and see it, um, is that it's a seagoing boat. And there is certainly evidence on the, if you look at it, you'll see on the front of the solar boat, which is a fairly simple design, it's about 150 foot long, it's, it's, it's certainly seagoing. On the front of it is some damage. And the damage was caused by coral, because coral damage on a wooden boat is very obvious yeah. if you know what you're looking for. This is coral. The nearest coral to Egypt is in the Red Sea. So how did this boat, 150 foot long, get to the Red Sea? Easy. It's called the Sweetwater Canal. It connects the Nile to the Red Sea. And it did thousands of years ago. That exists. You can see it on Google Maps today. So we know it was possible for the solar boat to travel from the Nile along the Sweetwater Canal into the Red Sea, down the Red Sea, follow the coast of Arabia, follow the coast of India, follow the coast of New Guinea, and you get to Australia. Guess what's been found in Australia? (laughs) Hieroglyphs depicting the shipwreck, because they probably didn't know about the Great Barrier Reef. Whoops, hit that, oh dear, that's a bit of a... But they got ashore, and they recount the story of a shipwreck on a voyage from Egypt. And these are hieroglyphs. And it's a place called Gosford, Gosford, north of Sydney. You can go and see them today. That's oh. what they depict. Egyptians were visiting Sydney. Uh, not Sydney, didn't exist then. Were visiting Australia thousands of years ago. And in the Cairo Museum is a display of boomerangs. Oh. Boomerangs originate from Australia. Because yeah, the ancient... I heard about that, actually. I heard about the ancient... That. Um, the original inhabitants of Australia, we now call them uh, Aboriginals, yeah. were the original inhabitants of this planet. The out of Africa theory 
has been seriously debunked. Yeah. It's out of Australia that the real movement of civilization took place. The mitochondrial DNA confirms it. The, uh, if you look at a modern Aboriginal, compare them to an African, there are similarities. Yeah, there are similarities in South America. They had the ability to sail, because the only way you could travel to South America from Australia is by boat. Yeah. They had the ability not only to build boats, but to sail them long distance. This is an area which is only just starting to be identified as an area for investigation, yeah. the out-of-Australia theory of human migration. Well, that's fascinating, that, by the way. That's really fascinating. We're going to dive into that. But, um, not, not to go there, because I have another question. But honestly, man, there's so, there's so much. It's crazy. <laughs> the, the, the question I want to ask you, though, is on the, um, when you were talking before and you mentioned the con- consciousness and things like that, I mean, a lot of people ask the question, did ancient Egyptians in the past have more advanced science than, than, we, do ha- we, than we have now? But something I'm actually thinking about is, is could it be possible that it was a different form of science and what I mean by a different form of science is could it actually be in a more of a like a metaphysical form of science science where we where they understand that internally they could actually get information inf- uh, information that, that they know that was inst- installed inside of us inst- inst- stored inside of everyone does that make, does that make yeah, sense yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we refer to it today as the Akashic Record yeah. where everything that has ever happened to everybody is known by everybody whether we remember it or not is another matter, yeah. whether we can recall it or not. But what we have behind our eyes and between our ears is the most extraordinary organ in the universe, the human brain. It is quite remarkable of what it can do. You can recall items, you can recall information that, that physically happened to you 50 years ago, or I can. You'll be able to do it. 50 years yeah. ago, you'll be able to remember instantly what you were doing on a particular day. Very few computers, all right, they can do it, but they have to be programmed to do it. We grew up with it. Yeah. I think we, a, people, uh, a lot of, sorry, I'll let you, no, I was going to say, I'll let you probably going to see the same thing as if I was going to say a lot of people don't actually comprehend how much, like the human brain itself is, a, or, the, or the whatever it is, the human body, in, in a sense, is, is some form of, is arguably to me, is an incredible piece of technology. I used to say that one of the best pieces of technology, but then someone else pulled us up on that in the podcast. But, incredibly arguably uh, one of the one of the best anyway and we underestimate how powerful maybe our own internal hardware is that's what i want to say anyway yeah that's yeah. absolutely correct we we totally underestimate our ability it's as if it's been switched off it's as if we're only allowed to use 10 percent of it yeah. and then you get into the well where did humans actually come from where, oh, we descended from apes, did we? Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Well, that's, that, that explains everything. So why haven't we got furry bodies? And uh, why are our well, legs... Well, Chris is quite hairy. Right. If you then start looking at some of the more esoteric explanations for how humans arrived on this planet, because we did arrive on this planet. Uh, uh, we didn't stagger up out of the sea and t- take a deep breath and say, oh, that's better, don't yeah. have to breathe seawater anymore. Um, if we were, were manipulated, if we were created, we now understand about genetic manipulation. Well, who's to say that it wasn't happening tens of thousands of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, it could well have been. Who are these ETs we keep hearing about and they keep appearing in our historical record? Anybody who doesn't believe in UFOs is not just not paying attention. Yeah, definitely. You just haven't examined the evidence. It's not a matter of belief, it's a matter of evidence. How much evidence do you want? If that occurred, if humans are a genetic manipulation of an ape, that's a far more logical explanation than evolved. The theory of evolution, emphasis on the word theory, mm-hmm. it's still a theory, guys. It's not a fact. Yeah, of course, of course. People want to believe evolution as a fact. It's not a fact, it's a theory. Yeah, it is. It's a complete theory. Because we haven't come across the missing link yet, the famous missing link that that, that um, archaeology and no, anthropologists keep saying, well, we're going to find the missing link between the ape that we know existed and humans that we now know existed. No, there's no missing link. There's nothing to find. It didn't occur. It came out of Australia. Yeah. Mm. If the humans were created as a result of genetic manipulation, and leaving aside the question of who did the genetic manipulation, 
and the purpose of it, which is completely another story, but if that did occur in that manner, that we were created for a specific purpose from a far higher intelligence, a race of far higher intelligence, they would protect themselves by deliberately switching off certain of their own attributes when it was transferred into what we now call humans. Wow. That makes a logic. That's logical mm -hmm. sense. That's what we do. It's like if you're going to create um, a slave, which is basically what we're talking about, slaves. If you're going to create a slave, you don't want the slave to start taking over what you have already created for yourself in your environment. You want him to do what you tell him. Yeah. We're now getting to the point where we can decide, hey, I don't think that that's the best way for us to live. Let's start trying to find out what we can do. What are our true abilities? Mm. Which is telepathy, psychokinesis, movement of an object at a distance, telepathy, communication without physical sound or, or movement. There are many abilities that we observe in one or two specific individuals. Savants are particularly relevant. There's about a hundred savants in the world who exhibit abilities beyond anything that we can possibly imagine. The ability to recall, to memorize certain things, to create music or play music, create drawing. Extraordinary. This, these are humans like you and me. Yeah. Uh, would have an ability that we would almost kill for. If, if, I'm, if I was just trying to think about the Akashic Records real quickly, couldn't we all have you all have that technology inside of us absolutely yeah, we have got it. Have. And this is this is the whole point we have got it inside us we can't access it mm -hmm. and this is the real challenge that's the real goal that, that's, that's our 21st century challenge should you choose to accept it yeah. mm -hmm. access our hidden strengths yeah. and then the, then there might even be peace on earth for goodness sake yeah, the, yeah. the thing that everybody wants but nobody knows how to go about finding I think that's probably a, um, a good place to wrap it up as well because obviously respect your time as well but I think as well we're definitely going to have to do this one million percent do this again because there's, so, definitely much, there's so much more as well there is but I think that's a good little it's a good, good, little, good little package for people's minds good introduction mind. <laughs> nice, thank you and maybe we'll so come cool. across the unfinished obelisk the, the rock softening liquid yeah yeah definitely so anybody going to South America find it you know please. what like, let's put it out there let's find that rock uh, the rock the softening rock, liquid yeah rock softening liquid yeah, yeah definitely. looks like treacle I'm told <laughs> Go look for it. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Powerhouse. Great. Wow. Thank you.